Hi, I'm Davey Wong. I'm making videos about crypto and this one will be about Dual EC. If you haven't been following, a few years ago, NIST published a PRNG, pseudo random number generator. And a few years later, in 2007, Ferguson and Schimmel, when trying to implement Dual EC for Microsoft, found out a backdoor. Afterwards, a huge controversy took place and the origins of the backdoored PRNG were traced back to the NSA. A few weeks ago, DJB, Lange and Niederhagen published a paper entitled Dual EC, a standardized backdoor. In the next minutes, I will attempt to explain to you why you would want to backdoor PRNG, how Dual EC works and how the backdoor works. But first, let's talk about random numbers. Every crypto primitive uses random numbers. Public random numbers, for example the IV of CBC, a mode of operation, or the client hello random from a TLS handshake, but also private random numbers, like when you forget your password and you need a recovery token to renew it, or the private key of a signature, etc. Usually, a system would use the same PRNG to produce both public and private random numbers. If the internal state of an application's PRNG could be recovered from one or several of its public random numbers, then all of the private random numbers could be recovered as well, and the, the application's security, based on its solid cryptography primitives, would then collapse. But developers rarely deal with random numbers. They do not want to think about stupid crypto. They use libraries that does the dirty work under the cover. These libraries follow guidelines and specifications to implement their cryptography primitives. You can find these in publications like the NIST ones. NIST is a government institution which aim is to help commerces and individuals implement strong crypto. Below that, you have cryptographers inventing these complex crypto primitives. Developers trust the libraries. Implementers of those libraries trust the cryptographers. So if you followed until now, you understand that a backdoor at the PRNG level, if exploitable, is very dangerous. So let me first explain what is a PRNG pseudo-random number generator. Uh, what is a typical structure for a PRNG? So we start with the seed, and if you reuse the same seed again, usually you will get exactly the same random numbers. So you might want to use a different seed every time. The seed comes from a different entropy pool. It, can, it could come from the temperature at the moment you use your PRNG, uh, the mouse movements and other, uh, the number of cycles from the boot of your computer and other stuff like that. All right, so give your seed to your program and you will compute an internal state. And that internal state, every time you ask for a random number, so for the first time you ask for a random number, will give you a random number. If you ask for your second random number, it will produce another state first and give you another random number. And if you need uh, bigger random numbers, you can do it, uh, you can request several states, several random numbers, and concatenate them into a bigger one. Uh, one thing you don't want is that the attacker can compute the internal state from the random number you give him. So what you do is that you use a one-way function on the internal state to compute your random numbers. So here, g is your uh, one-way function, so that if you have r1, uh, you cannot compute s1 from that. All right. Another thing that we want is called forward secrecy. Forward secrecy. And is that if you have an internal state, you cannot compute the previous internal state. So we use the same technique. We take another function, another one-way function, and we compute the next state every time thanks to that function. So S1 is equal to F of S0 and etc. Alright, if you want to protect, uh, if you want the attacker not to obtain the future internal states from one internal state, it's called backward secrecy. And we'll see later how you can do that. So that's a typical pseudo random number generator construction. Now, NIST uh, has published this uh, dual EC. 
algorithm that is a pseudo random number generator. And there are two versions actually. There is an updated one from 2007, so we'll first explain the first one that we'll call DLC 2006. And to explain that, uh, let me briefly uh, re explain elliptic curves. Uh, in elliptic curves in the elliptic group, uh, you can take a scalar, K, okay, and you can multiply that to a point P, uh, point P being, uh, for example, X and Y, and that gives you another number Q. And there is something that we call EC. DLP, uh, elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem, that states that if you know P, you know Q, it's very hard to find the value K. This is very hard uh, for big enough numbers. So we'll use the ECDLP to, uh, to prove uh, um, that our PRNG is secure. And usually this is how signatures and other uh, cryptographic schemes work thanks to uh, elliptic curves. Is that for example here you will say that P and Q are your public key and K is your private key and we'll see how this allows us to uh, construct a backdoor in GLC. Uh Sorry if I went too fast um, but it is this is kind of out of context for our our, our video. So DLC 2006 use a curve called P256 and hard-coded to points P and Q. Um, what I mean by hard-coded is that if you read the NIST specification, you will see that they tell you to use those two point P and Q in the algorithm dual EC. So this is kind of weird um, because so you will see variables and hard-coded values everywhere in cryptography, but usually what people use are called nothing up my sleeves numbers. Uh, those are numbers that you can verify. For example, they take the first digits of pi, or they hash uh, really famous uh, messages, like a really famous poem, and they used uh, the first numbers uh, to to use that as their in their in their algorithm as values. So everybody can verify that they didn't generate those numbers in a very specific way. Uh, with dual EC. There are no explanation where those numbers P and Q comes from, and that was very weird. There are other particularities with dual EC, for example, small biases or the fact that it's very slow, uh, but that is the cherry on the top. So dual EC works kind of the same. It's uh, you have a seed S zero, and to produce your your first state S one, you take S zero, and you multiply that with your point P, and you take the x coordinate. Right, because you're you're gonna have a new point x y, and you want a number, so you take the x coordinate. And when you want a random number, you're gonna just uh, do the same thing with s one, except you multiply that by q, and you take the x coordinate. Oh, uh, sorry, r one, and you do that on and on. Uh, s one times p, you take the x coordinate, it gives you the next state, internal state and you multiply that by q and you take the x coordinate to get the new number and actually if I want to be precise uh, you get rid of the 16 most significant bits and then you output the rest so since we are in the curve uh, p256 you will have uh, 256 minus the 16 bits here uh, random number so we can uh, we can prove that this is secure for forward secrecy and uh, recovery of the internal states because uh, those are one-way functions under the uh, EC DLP assumption, right? If you have that point uh, R1, it's very hard to find the scalar here if you know Q uh, and uh, R1. And same thing for S1, it's very hard to find S0 which is uh, kind of our private values. Okay, so one thing that we can think about is, uh, wait, uh, this is kind of weird, uh, What? how were P and Q generated? What if they were generated uh, using, for example, P equals uh, D, the, the value D times Q? So what if they had a Q, a point Q, and they, had, they chose a private scalar D? That nobody knows and that created their P so let's imagine that okay and let's imagine that uh, you're using their dual EC their dual EC algorithm and they're the attacker and they ask for a random number from you and you give them R1 
what they can do is that they can try all the possibilities for the rest for the 16 most significant bits and they can compute uh, R1 which will be X and Y a point and they can multiply R1 with T and that will be so R1 is a uh, S1 times Q right is this value so that will be T times S1 times Q which is exactly the same as S1 times D times Q and as I said here, imagine they generated P uh, like that with a secret value D, uh, then this would be equal to S1 times P. And what is S1 times P? Yeah, this is the next internal state. So what it means is that from a random number, from the output of a dual EC uh, pseudo random number generator, they can guess what will be the next state, internal state. So another variant of dual EC uh, 2006 allows us to have backward secrecy. That means from uh, one state, it's very hard to compute uh, another state, the future state. Previously, we had forward secrecy that allowed us to allowed us to avoid uh, the attack where an attacker had an uh, internal state and could recover previous internal states. But with backward secrecy, it's the inverse. All right. So you have your pawn a zero, the seed, and from your seed, you do the same thing. You do S0 times P, you take the X coordinate, and you have S1. And S1 gives you uh, R1 uh, from the point multiplication of S1 times Q. You take the X coordinate, and you remove the 16 first bits. So you have a 30 bytes uh, output. All right. Now, if you want to have uh, another random number, what you will do is that you will create an interme intermediate value and on that intermediate value, you will compute the points, multiplication. Um, to get that inter intermediate value, you use additional input, so we'll call that add-in. You hash that uh, additional input, and you XOR that with S1. And that's how you get the intermediate value. The additional input can come from the same source of entropy uh, of the seed, so that means like a number of CPU cycles since uh, the start of your computer or the temperature, the, anything you want. Uh, if you need a bigger random number, uh, it will not use that trick and directly compute the next internal state from the point multiplication of the previous internal state. And remember, we have two random numbers that we concatenate. To get a bigger one, um, and still the one-way function here. Let's not forget that. And if you want another random after random number after, it computes the intermediate va intermediate value and on and on. So here, this construction breaks dual EC backdoor, the backdoor of dual EC. Remember, uh, from R1, we would like imagine uh, compute the possible values for the 16 most significant bits. We'll compute the points R1, uh, and we will compute D times R1, which would be um, D times S1Q, which was S1 times P. And I was saying that from this, we could compute the next internal state, but that's not true anymore because the next internal state is actually done. Uh, by the point multiplication of the intermediate value. That was the internal state XORed with the additional input. So now we cannot use that backdoor anymore, except when we get more than 30 bytes of output. If we get that big output, we know that the next state will actually be uh, our state times the point. So we can still, still do the attack if we get a bigger state. And then to, to guess the next internal state, uh, so here there is S3 XORed with the hash of a new additional input. Then to guess the next internal state, we would have to guess what is the additional input. Uh, so our dual EC uh, backdoor is kind of broken because we need a bigger output to be able to, to, to do the attack. So in 2007, uh, NIST upgraded dual EC to, uh, to bring forward secrecy that we already had since we had a one-way function. So that 
seems kind of fishy. And what they did was uh, before computing the intermediate value, they would take the, the internal state and do the point multiplication on that internal state, take the x coordinates, and then compute the intermediate value. Same here. They take S3, they do the point multiplication, take the x coordinates. We have another intermediate value here, and then we compute uh, the XOR with the additional inputs. So now, when we use our backdoor, we do have S1 times P, and we can use that then to guess the additional inputs, and our backdoor works again. So that's good. We have fixed the backdoor. Um, so if you keep reading the paper, it will explain to you how the NSA uh, paid RSA a big amount of money to implement Dualisy in their toolkits. Uh, you will read about patches that were pushed by the NSA to uh, to make it more easy, easier to exploit uh, TLS uh, if TLS is using that Dualisy, and uh, it's. It, it's all very interesting. Uh, I advise you to, to continue reading that paper. Uh, I'm just gonna finish the video by quoting the, the technical director then of NSA, uh, who is now retired, and we say then to, to, to support the dual AC uh, algorithm and to, uh, to, to attack the, the criticism on dual AC. Uh, who said um, we were gonna use the dual elliptic curve randomizer, so dual AC. And I said, if you can put this in your standard, nobody else is gonna use it because it looks ugly, it's truly slow, it makes no sense for anybody to go there. But I'll be able to use it. And so they stuck it in. And I said, by the way, you know these parameters that we have here? As long as they're in there so we can use them, you can let anybody else put any parameters in that they want. Uh, so that doesn't make any sense. It's kind of hilarious, and uh, I thought that was like the like the best quote of uh, the best quote of this paper. So uh, yeah, just an uh, anecdote for you. But I advise you to rush uh, read that paper. Uh, and if you're interested in cryptography and other stuff like that, you can check my other videos on my YouTube channel, or you can check my blog at uh, cryptology.net. Uh, yeah. So, well, thank you for watching the video.